Uh, good morning, everybody. It is great to be with you, as always. And uh, I tell you, I want to thank you for the spirit that you live with. And uh, I treasure so much what God's doing because of how we're gathering together with hearts that really want to experience Jesus and express his goodness to our community. Can I get a good amen this morning? You know, I, uh, how many of y'all ever heard the phrase, man, time's flying when you're having fun? Can I see your hand if you heard that phrase? Well, I can tell you, that's how I felt as we're kind of marching out of March and advancing into April. I've just felt so enthused. I've never been more enthused about how we're moving forward by faith together in this season and how determined I see our church to live better than ever in the blessing of the Lord as the blessing that our friends and families and neighbors really need us to be. So I want to applaud you for that. You know, for me, time flies when I'm watching baseball. Can anybody relate to that? I can just watch it, and Tamara says, aren't you bored? And I say, no, I'm having the time of my life. Time flies for her when she's shopping. And uh, not even just shopping, but looking, time flies for her. Man, if, I, if I'm looking, uh, no, I want to I wanna get it, go home get something good to eat and feel like I had a victory. How many of you guys can relate? But this last month, I'm telling you, time has just flown by because I've been preparing, first of all, for the first uh, fine arts production we've done at this level since COVID put restrictions on us as a community, y'all. Tombs is going to be fantastic. And the singing, the acting, the technology is going to enhance a message that's burning in my heart about how we need to see our difficulties as a canvas that God's going to paint something beautiful on if we'll just totally give him our hearts. Can I have a good amen? And then the Good Friday service is titled A Beautiful Mess. And we're going to ask ourselves the question in the 10 minutes of teaching time I have, what did Isaiah see? 200 years before there was any historical documentation of crucifixion, Isaiah saw that the Messiah's body was going to be made into a beautiful mess. And God showed him the purpose that has the ability to change any life when we come in touch with the power of God. Can I have another good amen? And then I'm excited about the community egg hunt. And mostly I'll just hear about that because I'll be studying for Easter. But I know that, you know, a lot of you are coming together and you have a heart to, to love kids like Jesus loved them, to live to be a blessing like he did. And because of that, there's going to be a great event at Memorial Stadium. And then I know Easter Sunday is going to be exceptional. But uh, you know, it all starts with prayer. Everybody say prayer. When we pray, we align our hearts with the passion of the Holy Spirit. When we pray, we accomplish through God's power what we would never accomplish if we were living self-centered, you know, unfocused lives. So that's why we're starting next Sunday. Everybody say next Sunday. We're going to start next Sunday from 6 to 7.30 prayer walking our communities, and uh, if 240 of us do this together for 90 minutes, we figured out we can, we can invite every single one of our neighbors to experience God's goodness and to understand the passion of Jesus, love, his passionate love, the power he has to change lives. We can invite all of them into what we're going to experience this Easter and I declare that we're going to see more people's lives touched by God from tombs until Easter than we have any year we've ever existed as a church. How many of y'all can say amen to that with me this morning, all right? So here's what I need to do. Like I said, we're going to be prayer walking from 6 to 7.30, Sunday night, April 3rd, Monday night, April 4th, Tuesday night, April 5th, skip Wednesday for church, Thursday night, April 7th. 8th, uh, Friday night, April 9th, and then Tombs is on Saturday. So here's what I want you to do. All of you bow your heads and close your eyes. And if the Lord has told you not to prayer walk, I want you to lift your hand. If he's absolutely told you, you're not supposed to prayer walk. Okay, for the rest of you, I want you to assume he's telling you to do it, all right? And uh, the reason is, I promise you, eternity is going to be impacted by what we do during those prayer walks. And I know we're all moved by the people of Ukraine. I mean, I, I go home and I watch videos at night from different news sources. And to see these women training with weapons with the words unbreakable behind them, man, it motivates me. And, uh, you know, in America, we're in a battle too, y'all. It's not 
for our land, at least not right now, but we're in a battle for our culture and we're in a battle for our community. Can somebody give me a good amen? And how many of you declare this will be the church's finest hour? We're going to put a big smile on the face of Jesus. So it starts next Sunday night. If you're willing to prayer walk, I need to get about 150 of you. We have about 100 already, but I'd rather get like 500 of you so we could finish in 30 minutes, right? So let me see your hand if you're willing to prayer walk. Wave your hand at me. Okay, if you're willing for your prayer, your neighbor to prayer walk, would you lift their hand too? No, I'm just kidding. Let me see your hand again if you're willing. Look at all these great hands. Come on, this is awesome. Look at all the prayer walkers we're going to have. Fantastic. Let's give them a good hand. And uh, after we get done with the, the message and all today, Pastor Larry will ask you to go out of that door so that we can form our teams. And we're going to have maps ready. We're going to blitz this city with the power of God. Amen? Well, let's pray together. Lord, we pray as we study your word today that God just show us why so often we work so hard, but our relationships just don't work out. And Lord, it's because if they're built on the wrong foundation, a foundation outside of your word, you told us that they would fail. So Lord, we don't want to be among those failing. We want to be among those flourishing. And God, we want to help our family and friends do the same. So Lord, we ask you to help us learn what's in your heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. From the time we're young, we're told that we have to honor certain laws if life's going to work out. So our parents will teach us, you know, health laws and relational laws. They'll teach us about laws we need to really honor if we're going to succeed in life. And then we go to school and educators start to teach us about laws of mathematics and laws of spelling. And they're doing that so that that part of our life begins to work out. I know this week I was on my computer and I started spelling the word interrupted. And when I did, I could hear my English uh, teacher's voice in my head saying to me, now, Jimmy, when you come to the end of a certain syllable, you have to double the consonant and then you have to finish the word. And I was thinking, man, she would be so proud of me if she saw me spelling this word right, right now. And then I got to the bottom of my page and I realized Man, there are way too many spell check words that are on this page. And I thought maybe she wouldn't be so proud of me. But today we're going to talk about one of Jesus' cardinal laws concerning relationships. And we're going to see that this law is playing out in everybody's family. And because it's being ignored instead of being dishonored, there's a lot of damage that's being done. We're going to study a story that begins in Mark chapter 10, verse 32. And it ends in Mark 10, 45. But I'm going to read the end of it first. And the reason I'm going to do that is because it's at the end of this particular circumstance that Jesus shares this important law with his disciples. And the Bible says this in Mark 10, 41. It says, when the ten apostles who heard something, they became indignant with James and John. And because of that, Jesus had to call them together and he had to say something to them. Now, what they were doing was walking towards Jerusalem. Jerusalem, and Jesus had already explained to the people traveling with him twice that he was going to Jerusalem, and he was going to be terribly mistreated, and he was going to end up dying whenever he got to Jerusalem. And, and as they were walking to Jerusalem, you know how it is whenever crowds of people walk together, right? There are some people who, they're what I call the slow people. They want to take in all the scenery. They want to go at a pleasant pace. And then you got your fast movers who feel like, man, I got to be out front and I got to make sure everything on this journey goes right. But that wasn't the focus of this, but the focus is that something happened that caused Jesus to have to call them together. And, and when he talked about what he talked about, the Bible says that the people grew indignant. And I think today that as we began to see what they grew indignant about, we're going to say, you know what? I felt the same way towards people for the reasons Jesus was talking about. And not only that, but I've had people feel the same way towards me about the thing that Jesus is talking about. So let's go ahead and read what happened. Jesus said this when he gathered them together. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord power over them and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Now look at your neighbor this morning and say, not so with you, all right? Some of you are going to be saying, 
saying this all week, I'm sure. But Jesus said, not so with you, but instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must become a slave of all. Then Jesus said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but he came to serve, and he gave to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus said, even though I, I'm the son of God and I came from heaven and nobody has lived as sinless as I have, he didn't say all this, but it's true that nobody lived as wise as he could, but still Jesus said, I didn't come to be in charge, but I came to the earth and I came to serve for a really important reason. And that's what we're going to talk about about today, that loving interpersonally as Jesus does has some cardinal laws attached to it, and one of those cardinal laws is this fifth key, and that is that it's not going to be about me, but it's going to be about we. Now, you remember our master text in John 13 that the Bible says before Jesus was crucified, he said, a new command, I give you, I want you to love one another. And then he said, I'm not, it's not just something I'm teaching you, but it's something I'm modeled for you, and that is, as I've loved you, so you must love one another. And in our second message, we talked about how Jesus taught this, this particular lesson in, in circumstances that really clarified the importance of it, that he had just said to Judas, now, you're going to betray me, so I want you to go ahead and do, Judas, what you feel like you got to do. And in that setting, Jesus was showing us that there are a lot of people around us who are acting in ways that betray their best interest. Sin has talked them out of the life they should really want to live. And we have to love each other and we have to help each other not make those mistakes. And then after Jesus taught the lesson, he looked at Peter, who was their leader. And he said, even the best among you are going to make some really bad choices. Peter, listen, before the rooster crows tonight, you're going to deny me three times. And Jesus was showing them us that listen, even the best among us do stupid things when we go through difficult times, and that's why we have to learn to love one another. And, and these are the cardinal laws of love, according to Jesus. I've made an acrostic to help us understand that loving interpersonally as Jesus loved starts with us finding treasure in loving God and one another, and then learning to rely on real love, not a phony love, and then investing in each other's success successfully eliminating toxic interaction, and then today not living a me lifestyle, but a we lifestyle. Now, I want to tell you a story this morning that I don't think any of you will have experienced this story that I experienced, but I promise you that you felt the way that I felt as I was experiencing this moment in my life. When I was a kid, I didn't grow up around beaches. I grew up around mountains in western Pennsylvania. So whenever we got invited to go to Costa Rica, my friend and I, and to preach open-air rallies in the country, I'd never been on a beach very much in my life. And uh, we were down there with a missionary, and he had Bible school students who were starting churches, and uh, we went to a city on the east coast of Costa Rica called Limon. And we had about two, three free hours every day, and during that time, we would go to the beach, and we would run, and we'd pretend we were, we were like Rocky. How many of you remember the Rocky movies, you know? And we weren't married yet, trying to keep our bodies thin back at the time. And then when we got done, we would do, you know, sit-ups on the beach. And then he taught me to body surf, which I'd never done before, but I was having a blast. The only problem is when you wipe out real bad, oftentimes sand goes up your shorts. How many of you know what I'm talking about? So the solution was that we would go out into the water, way out in into the deep water, we would take down our shorts, we would get the sand off of our body, and we would be okay. Well, for me one time, the sand was so bad, I took my shorts totally off, and I had them in my hand when this big wave crashed and hit me, and the shorts went out of my hand, and when I started looking, they weren't anywhere to be found. And finally, my friend looked at me, and he said, I hate to tell you this, but he said, I think they got in an 
undertow and your shorts are out at sea. Now, I instantly had the awareness to sing a James Taylor song, Ain't It Good to Know You Got a Friend. And I looked at him and I begged him to go back to the hotel, which was two, 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 uh, two miles away, and to bring me my shorts. And thankfully he did, though he took way longer than he should have <laughs> taken on that walk. But I'm telling you, though you may not have that exact story, I promise you there are times in your life whenever you felt stranded and you said to yourself, I can't fix this relationship on my, by myself. I can't get this family where it needs to be by myself. You know, at work, it just seems like nobody will even talk to me about the difficulties that we're going through. And that's why Jesus taught what he taught. Remember Matthew 18, 19, where Jesus said, again, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it's going to be done for them by my Father who's in heaven. So Jesus taught us that whenever we learn to really respect the nature of God, and we learn to rely on each other and pray and obey God together. He said, I can take what's damaged and broken and not working in your life, and I can cause you to flourish, and I can cause you to be blessed. So this morning, I want to answer two questions. First of all, I want to talk about why we fight with each other. And the first reason is simply this. We want to be first, don't we? If you read this story, I'm going to go back to the beginning now. It says they were on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus was leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. And again, Jesus took the 12 aside, and he told them what was going to happen to him. Now, first of all, why were the 12 astonished at Jesus? Well, remember, he'd already told them twice that he was going to go to Jerusalem, and he was going to die. And they were astonished at the courage he was demonstrating, the determination that they saw in his face. One gospel writer said this, that Jesus set his face like flint towards Jerusalem because he was so determined to fulfill the purpose God sent him into the earth to fulfill. But other people were fearful. If they're going to kill Jesus and do this to Jesus, what's going to happen to us? And it's interesting that the Bible says that Jesus pulled the 12 to him again and he said, we're going to go to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the teachers of the law. Now, the term son of man was a term that was reserved for the Messiah. So Jesus was saying, now the Messiah is going to be handed over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And then he said, they're going to condemn me, and they're going to hand me to the Gentiles who will mock me and spit on me and flog me and kill me. But then three days later, I'm going to arise. And gratefully, there was victory at the end of what Jesus was getting ready to do. But listen, the disciples knew that Jesus was describing the most excruciating physical and emotional experience that anybody could possibly go through. Whenever the Romans would flog somebody, we'll talk about it in our Good Friday service, but they would take this whip with bones and with, with metal and they would begin ripping a person's back. And they wouldn't stop until they ripped his back and they went the whole way down to his calves. They would actually rip his arms as well. A lot of times ribs were broken, the liver was lacerated, and people would literally be begging for water because they lost so much blood just from flogging. And Jesus went through that whenever he was flogged, and then afterwards he was crucified on the cross. Now I describe that for a reason, and that is that the Bible says after Jesus said this to his disciples, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, and they said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, isn't it amazing that Jesus could be talking about the most excruciating experience a person could ever go through, and the question they would ask is, Jesus, will you do something for us? Will you do whatever we ask you to do? Not, Jesus, what can we do for you, but, Jesus, will you do for 
us whatever we ask. Now, I would be expecting at this point something like, Jesus, tell us what your favorite food is, and we're going to run to the village, and we're going to get you whatever you want to eat. Or, Jesus, are you thirsty? What's your favorite drink? We want to run, and whatever it takes, we want to bring it back to you. Or, Jesus, do you want us to massage your back, massage your feet? Listen, we are so proud of the way that you're handling your call. We just want to bless you. But the Bible says next that Jesus looked back at them and, and he said to them, listen, what do you want me to do for you? And they replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in glory. So they weren't thinking about what, what, what they could do for Jesus, but instead they were talking to Jesus, asking him for position and for power and for things that people that don't even know God want. And that's when Jesus chose the opportunity to say, listen, guys, that isn't how the kingdom of God works. Listen, that's how the Gentiles do it. That's how people who don't know God do it. They fight to be first. They fight for their own way. But instead, I want you guys to teach them how I loved. Now, I want to put this in the best perspective I possibly can this morning. So maybe we can see ourselves in this story. And I want us to think that for James and John, maybe as they were listening to Jesus and he was talking about how he was going to die and he couldn't be their leader anymore, maybe they thought, well, Jesus, you know that we're the best leaders in this group. After all, our daddy had the biggest fishing business and he taught us more leadership skills than anybody else in the room. So we're ready, Jesus, to take charge whenever you die. But then I can just see Peter pipe up in my mind. And he said, hold it. Anybody here walked on water? It's going to take some faith to get us through these trials that are ahead. And I think I'm the best person to lead this particular group of people. And then I can see Thomas uh, step up and say, hey, you guys all know I'm the smartest guy in the room, and we need to make some good decisions, so I think maybe I need to be in charge. And then I see Nathaniel step forward, and Nathaniel says, no, I'm a military guy, and I've got the kind of background to make the tough calls and tough times, so I think maybe I'm supposed to be the guy who's in charge. But listen to what the Bible says about selfish ambition and how it creeps into our life. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Philippians too, he said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourselves. Now, we're not taught to love other people above ourselves, but Jesus taught us to love others as we love ourselves. And there's a reason for that, and that is the way we're made, we naturally think about ourselves. How many of y'all have ever tried to choose a Christmas picture that had more than five family members? in it. Can I see your hand? And you're trying to choose the right one and everyone's saying, no, I look bad in this one. I look bad in the other one. And for them, that Christmas picture really comes down to, I want the one that makes me look good to be the one that goes out. And the Bible says, don't be that way. But it says that, listen, I instead of doing that, learn the power that humility has to transform your relationships. I love what one man said about humility. He said, said, humility is not thinking less of ourselves, it's just thinking of ourselves less. And it's causing us to get in touch with the other people in the room. And what's going to bring forth the very best for every single one of us who are in the room. And that's what Jesus was helping them to see. Now, here's the deal. Listen, we live in a society that doesn't tell us that self-ambition and self-promotion are appalling, but they tell us it's something that we should appreciate, something we should go after as people. I challenge you just to Google self-promotion this week, and uh, I promise you, your pages are going to fill up with all these people trying to teach you the importance of self-promotion and how you need to promote your life. I wrote down just a few of them. One person told me they can give me a complete guide to self-promotion. Somebody else says they'll teach me savvy self-promotion. That's a good title, isn't it? And then here's my favorite. Somebody said five tips for practicing self-promotion without totally being annoying. Now, how many of you know if you're self-promoting, you are annoying? Can you say amen? And it's because of the fact that none of us want people around us who are thinking about, uh, about the 
themselves. We want people to think about we. We want them to think about us. Hey, can I tell you what concerns me so much today? It really doesn't matter what arena. We can be talking about the political arena, and people will say, we need a president who is. And they'll act as if the president has the power to turn our whole country around. Or it can be the school arena, and people will say, what we need is a leader who. And they act as if a leader can turn our whole country around. Can I tell you the real problem? We need God. And if we don't get God back in our hearts, it doesn't matter who our leaders are. Things are going to stay messed up. We need to write values to take control of our lives. And that's what Jesus was saying. He was saying, when you think we instead of me, it begins to change everything. And he said, here's the problem. Listen, God doesn't tell us that we're supposed to be first. He tells us we should desire to be part of a fellowship where God's answering prayer. Then here's the second thing that causes us to fight, and that is we want to be noticed. In Matthew 23, Jesus uh, was talking to the crowds and As he was, he said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but don't do what they do, for they don't practice what they preach. And I read this this week, and I thought, man, I love how Jesus led. Because first of all, he said, because they're reading from the Bible, because they're teaching you God's word, you should do everything that they're telling you to do. And I I thought about the things that have become fashionable in our society today. You know, it's kind of fashionable to be a bit rebellious, isn't it? It's kind of fashionable to say, well, you know, I'm not in church because the church does this wrong and church does that wrong and the church does something else wrong. And I just want to ask you a question. What's the right response? Is it to criticize people who aren't living perfect or is it to live so perfect that everybody gets inspired to to live for God? See, we have a trouble in this society, and that is things have become uh, appreciated and applauded that really, like Jesus, we need to be pointing out, we need to be admonishing people, and we need to say, listen, if we don't get this together, God can't bless our lives. And Jesus said about these people, you should listen because they're teaching the Word of God. Then he said, but listen, he said, don't don't do everything they say because in their example, they're not practicing what they preached. He said they want to be noticed. First of all, he said they love the place of honor, or or they love making their phylacteries wide and their tassels long. You know why they did that? The phylacteries were what they would put on their forehead, and it would contain God's word. And when they made it bigger, what they thought they were saying is, I'm living a big part of the word of God. And Jesus said, listen, if you're living it big, you don't need to tell people with your phylactery. How many of you know people notice when Never were living God's word big. And then he said they loved the best places in banquets and they loved to be honored. In other words, religious leaders should know that when we go, we want the people honored who the banquet's for. We want the father honored. We want the mother honored. We want the married couple to be honored. We're not to go to banquets to seek our own honor. It's one reason if you've got a, a, a young person in our children's department or in our youth department, I, I tell our our pastors all the time, I say, I do not want you to be the hero in their children's lives. And here's why. Whenever that child goes through a crisis, you're not going to be the one who's there at three o'clock in the morning taking their call. What I want you to do is I want you to build families who learn to let Jesus be the hero. And I want you to build families where kids honor their parents and parents nurture their children. Because how many of you know God will bless our families if we live in families like that, right? And Jesus said we end up fighting each other because we want to be first. We want to be noticed. Then he said we want to be in control. James 4, he says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire? Desires that battle within you, you desire, but you don't have, so you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. And you don't have it really because you're not asking God. And every one of us here have had people who've assassinated our reputation. They've treated things that are dear to us in ways that they could have damaged them. And many times, if you get to the heart of why they do it, it's simply because they didn't get their own way. And Jesus said, what kind of community do you want to be a part of? Do you want to 
be a part of that kind of a community where people feel stranded whenever they're in need because people are more concerned about what they want from them than what they want to see happen for them in life. And Jesus was saying, you can either be part of the failing community or what causes us to flourish together? Well, three things. Number one, and we read this earlier, when we understand humility is the answer and we choose humility over ambition. Philippians 2.3 says this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Now, how do we start to cultivate humility in our hearts? Well, what we do is we make it our ambition to be the first one to apologize whenever we get in an argument and do something we shouldn't do. We make it our ambition to to see other people's sides instead of working so hard to get everybody to see our side. How do we choose humility? We do it by seeing that everybody's loved whenever there's a circumstance of strife that we're involved in. You know, there's a great story in Acts chapter 9. It's about a disciple named Tabitha. And the Bible says that she was always doing good and she was always helping the poor. Now here's the question. If people were to define you today, what would they say that you're always doing? Are you always showing up late to work? And are you always leaving early? Or are you always helping new people who come to work learn what they need to learn so they can succeed too? Are you always in the strife zone? Is there always something wrong? Are you always the person who's setting the example so that everything goes better when you seem to be in the room? You see, when this person named Tabitha died, you know what the Bible says? That they went and looked for Peter and they said, Peter, pray for her and raise her from the dead. They didn't want to do life without Tabitha. And how many of you know when we become those kinds of people in the world, that's whenever all of a sudden our whole world comes together. So the Bible says that we're to choose humility over ambition. Then number two, it says choose humility over fame. Jesus said, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of other people to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from from your Father in heaven. In other words, to overcome this, 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 this curse of self-ambition that destroys relationships all around us, the Bible says, first of all, make it your ambition to be humble, to see other people's side, to listen to people. Then make it your ambition just to do right. And when we do right, God rewards us. And, 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 and basically the Bible's saying, why are you trying to do all this to get people's favor on your life? Whenever in reality, if you have God's favor on your life, he guarantees you that he's going to bless you and he's going to bless your family. And then there's a third thing that we have to do, and that is we have to choose humility over over wanting control. Now I want to read my final scripture in John 15 verse 7 where the Bible says that Jesus taught his disciples if you abide in me and my words abide in you you're going to start asking for what you desire and it's going to be done for you. In other words if we come to church and we're asking God for stuff all the time and it's not coming to pass in our life Jesus said I'm going to teach you a better way. And that is instead of coming to church and asking God for stuff and maybe even getting mad at God whenever things don't go your way, what I want you to do is I want you to respect the presence of the Lord and to be humble and to believe if you humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, as the Apostle Peter promised, in due time he will bless you because of how you honored him on the inside of your heart. I want you to believe that perhaps your problem is that you need to transition from a self-centered life to a God-honoring life where you do whatever God asks you to do. Can you say amen? Now, this is difficult to do, I promise you. And it's why whenever Jesus had to deal with the disciples who were indignant at the two who were living ambitious lives, Jesus didn't straighten not James and John, did he? But what he did was he called all 12 of them together. And he said, now I'm going to teach all of you guys a life lesson. And that is, if you want God to answer your prayers, quit living for self and start living for the whole community. And can I tell you from my own life, this isn't easy to do. I remember years ago, Tamara and I had had four kids. And when you have four kids, there's some things you just don't do like you should. Can you say amen? 
one of those is open the car door for my wife. So we were out on a date one night, and it dawned on me I hadn't opened her car door in about 1,278 days. And I jumped out of the car, and I ran over. She was getting ready to open the door, and she looked at me like, what's wrong with him? And I said, I want to open your car door. Of course, she smiled. She was so happy. And then we were eating at a Chinese restaurant in on Navarro. And when I got to the door, I opened it and went in front of her. Everybody say, God help our pastor, right? <laughs> it's so easy to put yourself first. And you're not going to do it perfect, so we don't need to be hard on each other. We just need to help each other. Because if we do this, instead of dividing our relationships through selfish ambition, there's going to be a devotion form where we start helping each other, experience answers to our prayer. Let me tell you a final story that illustrates our challenge. And that is about a month ago, uh, you ladies had your conference, and Andrea came with her family. And, of course, Ava James is my first grandchild. She's so beautiful. And uh, we were up in the office after the Sunday service was over, and we were, we were eating with Caroline Leaf and her husband, Mac. And when we got done, Mac said, hey, let's take a picture together. So Jeffrey was in the room. He came to meet Caroline Leaf, and I had Ava because I kidnap her and keep her every moment that I can. And uh, Jeffrey, of course, realized he didn't need to be in the picture, so he offered to take the picture. And I looked at him, and I thought, good job, Mom. This kid has really grown up, and he's becoming more like Jesus every day. And then whenever Jeffrey was getting ready to snap the picture, little Ava James couldn't imagine us wanting a picture without Ava in it. So she started sprinting to get in the picture before Jeffrey snapped the picture. And, of course, we all thought it was so cute that we took another picture where Ava was in the picture smiling real big. And can I tell you what that is? That's selfish ambition. Now, I'm not going to get it out of her because I'm grandpa and I'm called to spoil her. Not really. It's the parents who have to get the selfish ambition out of their kids. And how many of you know that's a big task, isn't it? But how many of you know our life becomes a beautiful picture, a much better picture whenever we let Jesus have his way and we make up our mind we're going to love each other as he taught us to love. Amen. Hey, I want to pray for you, but first I have a word for you, Miss Evelyn. It came to me last night when I was praying for the service. Would you stand up? I want you all to just give this woman a hand clap right here. And I don't know why God wanted me to give you this word in front of the whole church, but I feel like I'm supposed to. And if you don't know Miss Evelyn, she has been such an amazing servant. Maybe it's because I preached about Tabitha, always blessing people. But listen, her husband, who she loved, went to heaven in 1999. And I have seen her love people, lead a widow's group in our church, uh, just be so generous with her time and her talent. And she's blessed so many of us. And I, when I was walking the trail, I felt like the Lord just wanted to say this to you, Miss Evelyn. He wanted to say thank you. And he wanted to say thank you for loving me. Thank you for being my bride. Thank you for showing people what it means to really live as a Christian. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your good works. And listen, let's do this with passion until it's time to go see him. Can you say amen? And we pray that's a long time, a long, long time. Amen. Come on, let's give Miss Evelyn a good hand clap. Amen. We love you. We love you so much. Hey, can we all bow our heads and can we pray? And uh, before we go, we want to do one more thing, and that is, if you're here and you say, you know, Pastor Jim, man, I love that music. Had such a good message to it. And maybe you say, man, I know Jesus is right. I, I hear teaching from the Bible, and I know he's right. But in your heart, you know that, you know what, things just aren't going the way they should. And God needs, he needs your heart. Or maybe he needs a bigger part of your heart today. You know, the Bible doesn't say we receive blessing and salvation because we hear the message. But I want you to hear some words that Peter wrote in Acts 3, 19. He says, repent then and turn to God so your sins may be wiped out and so times of refreshing may come from the Lord. 
It's two parts. First of all, we turn from sin. Everybody say, from sin. And then we turn to God, and God begins to love us. But just because we hear doesn't mean we turn from sin. I heard all kind of information about texting and driving. And I'm going to confess my sin to you. It took me a little while until I said, I'm not doing this anymore. Because it's dangerous. I don't want to be on the wrong side of this. In the same way, we can hear message and message about the damage sin does and not make the adjustment we need to make. But God wants some of you today to turn from sin. Turn from the pleasure of it. Turn from the pain it's causing in your life. Listen, we've all been there, but the Bible says God wants us to turn from sin. And he wants us to turn to Jesus who always is going to love us, always going to refresh us, always going to strengthen us, always going to give us the wisdom we need to see the things that have gone wrong in our life turned around. If you're here today and you say, you know, Pastor Jim, that's me. Today, I'm ready to turn from a self-centered life or maybe even a sinful life, and I'm ready to live in the love of Jesus. I'm going to count to three, and when I get to three, I just want you to shoot up your hand. We're going to pray for you at your seat this morning. Are you ready? One, two. Two, if you're ready to experience the goodness of God, three, lift up your hand all over this place. Amen. God bless you. 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 Wonderful. God bless you. God bless you. Is there anybody else? God bless you right there. God bless you. Way up in the risers. God bless you. That's awesome. Okay, let me ask one more question. Maybe you're here, you say, you know, Jim, I've served God at one time, but I strayed. And today I want to come back and I want to experience God's love. If that's you, would you lift your hand too all over this place? We want to pray for you. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, church family, you can look up. Let's put our hand on our heart. Let's pray this together. Let's say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. And today I turn from sin. Lord, I acknowledge that sin is why you were beaten, why you were tortured, why you went to the cross. And Lord, today, I'm so thankful that you came to forgive us, to restore us, to heal us, and to love us. Lord, today, I say no to sin and yes to you. Thank you for salvation. Amen. Can we give a good hand clap to all those who prayed that prayer? <laughs> and hey, if you prayed that prayer before you go, we want you to know, as we said, that we don't just want you to turn from sin, but we want you to experience the goodness of God. And we want you to become an expression of God's goodness to your family so they can live for God too. So before you go, we want to give you a free gift. It's in a white packet by our offering boxes. In the packet is a book, 30 Days to a New Beginning. It's a, a short devotional you can read every morning to fuel your faith. There's also a card where you can sign up to be baptized and another card where you can tell us how to best serve you as a church family. The people in this room want to get behind you. We want to see your prayers answered. So thank you for coming to church today. And uh, we're looking forward to you living with a future filled with that. If you're online and you prayed that prayer, we're so excited for you too. If you'll message us, we'll make sure you know how you can get one of those packets as well. Well, good afternoon, church. Well, are you glad you're in God's house today? Wasn't that a great word? Amen. That was both an amen and an ouch message, right? One lady said all the time, she said, if, when I'm coming to church, if I'm not squirming, I'm not learning. So it's good when we squirm, right? What a great word. Thank you to a pastor who makes it so clear so that we can carry it out well and live well and blessed. Amen. Let's give Pastor Jim a good hand for that. I want to receive our tithes and offerings for God's work this morning, Faith Family. And I want to say just thank you, first of all, for supporting God's house. Week in and week out. Thank you for supporting it with your prayers, your resources, your time, your talent, and your treasure. We're so grateful. You know, you can tell when a home or a house, when they honor God. Can't you 
tell people? Could you tell a family when they honor God? I mean, the kids are loved and nurtured and God is put first. And, you know, you can see God's influence. It can be felt in the home. And, and, and thank God for that. But you know what? God's house is to nurture our house. It's to help us have a foundation of his wisdom and truth that helps us live well and lead well in our homes. You know, Joshua was the leader of God's people after Moses. And he was getting ready to die. Everybody say die. He was 110 years old. He had led him into the promised land. And so he was sharing with them God's uh, just renewing the covenant. He was reminding them to follow God. This is what he said in the scripture. He said, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you'll serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So thank you for choosing to serve the Lord. You and your household. Thank you for all the ways that you give week in and week out so that this region is blessed and then some of the darkest places of the world. How many of you are glad that we get to make a difference in India and Ukraine and, you know, some of those Damascus, some of the darkest places of the world. So thank you. You know, this week is going to be, a, uh, these next few weeks are going to be big weeks around here. And I know all of us want to see, you know, people experience God in a, in a fresh way. As, you know, we approach Easter and all the great services and special things that we're having, we're going to saturate our neighborhoods with prayer. We're going to invite people. How many of you think it's a good idea for your neighbors to be invited to church, right? So we want you to be a part of that. Those of you who can, Jim and I have done it before. It's just so much fun to just have our feet on the ground, boots on the ground, to pray for people in the homes, you know, there. So we're going to ask you, if you would, to sign up. Make sure before you leave today, sign up for our prayer walk in the Connection Center after service. Everybody say after service. Okay, we want you to walk with us. Let's get ready to, to give today. Right, well, let's lift our gift up to the Lord or our phone, however we're given today, and let's ask him to bless it. Father, I thank you so much for the privilege that we have to give. Lord, as we give today, I just thank you that you meet every need the church has, and I pray that, Father, blessing come to each person. I pray every need they have would be met. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, the prayer partners are going to be here in just a few minutes when they come up. Uh, how many raised your hand earlier and said that you would help us prayer walk? All right. I'm, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm, if you raise your hand and said you're going to prayer walk, I want you to um, right now get up and go out that door right there. Okay? If you raised your hand and, and you're going to do it, I'm going to speak a blessing, but I'm going to speak it as you're walking out. <laughs> right through those doors, right straight through. If we can ask some ushers help get the doors open. And uh, right into the Connection Center, they're waiting for you to sign up. All right, let's give them a good hand as they do that. And the rest of us, let's stand up and uh, let's declare this over us and them. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a great week. Amen. What an awesome, awesome service today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Hey, before you head off and go about your day, we just want to encourage you. If you haven't really um, learned about what's going on here at Faith Family during Easter, man, I encourage you, scroll through our Facebook, get on our social media, our website, and find out everything that's going on at Easter. Trust me, we have so many wonderful things, beautiful things that God has just poured out so much creativity on our creative department. We're going to bless some people this Easter season, but we're going to see people come to him like never before. And so we just want to encourage, if you don't know, have an idea what's going on around here coming up very, very soon in just 14 days, I encourage you, find out. Go to our social media, go to our website. Also, if you're interested in being a part of that 200 um, needed people to do the prayer walk, God is calling us to do this as a church. I want to encourage you, you can sign up as well. Just because you're not here today and we have people signing up in the Connection Center doesn't mean that you can't be a part as well. So you can comment in the comments below. Let us know, hey, use me. I want to do it. What 
do I do? Where do I go? Our moderators are going to be looking for that information in the comments below. Also, if you prayed that salvation prayer, we just want you to know genuinely we're so proud of you. And we love you, we see you, and we are for you. And we want to get a gift in your hand in your hands as soon as possible. There's a bag that we've put together of helpful resources that will help you take your, your next steps in your journey with God. And you can't do it alone, and we're here to help. So let us know in the comments below that you prayed that salvation prayer so we can get that to you. Other than that, God bless you, church family. We love you, and we'll see you on Wednesday.